guys, welcome to Empowerin. Thank you so much as usual for watching my YouTube channel. In this video, we're going to go over the skeletal muscle cells. We are going to learn how the skeletal muscle cells have nerves, fibers, blood vessels, and connective tissues. This video is going to be jam-packed with information because we're also going to take a microscopic look at the skeletal muscle cells. You're going to learn things like the sarcolemma, the organelles, the mitochondria, and more. This is the 17th video in this anatomy. 101 video series. So if you have not seen the other videos, make sure you click the link above and you will be directed to the entire course. So without any further ado, let's get right into the video. Skeletal muscles. In this section, we are delving deeper into the parts and functions of skeletal muscles. These muscles attached to the bones can be completely identified as skeletal striated voluntary muscles. You may think that there's nothing more to them than just a bunch of tissues created to make movement possible. But you will be extremely fascinated at how complicated their structure is. First of all, skeletal muscles have nerves, muscle fibers, blood vessels, and connective tissues. Let's see, one example of skeletal muscle is the bicep. You know, the one we flex to make our arm muscles bulge. Now this bicep is composed of hundreds, even thousands of cylindrical shaped cells called muscle fibers, which are surrounded by a connective tissue called endomyosome. The muscle fibers will be grouped together in bundles or compartments called fascicles. The fascicles will determine the strength, shape, and range of motion and the form of the skeletal muscle. If each muscle fiber is covered by endomyosin, remember that each compartment on the other hand is protected by another connective tissue called perimyosin. Now the compartments or bundles will come together to form the biceps and will now be covered by the connective tissue called the epimyosin. To summarize, there will be an epimyosin on the outermost layer of the skeletal muscle. Then the perimyosin will cover each bundle of muscle fibers. Now each muscle fiber will be protected by another type of connective tissue called the endomyosin. Another interesting fact. All these three connective tissues will extend beyond the flesh of the muscle to form a thick rope-like structure called tendons or a flat sheet called eponeurosis. Commonly, we refer to the tendons as the structure responsible for muscle bone attachment. However, there are times when eponeurosis takes the tendons place because it can cover wider areas. More of this attachment will be discussed a little bit later in this video. For now, let's move on to the other structures present in the skeletal muscle, namely the nerves and the blood vessels. You see, since muscle needs contraction to move, and movement may happen because of a stimulus or because of our own commands, there must be nerves present in the skeletal muscle. Otherwise, where would the impulse come from? Now, each nerve is usually accompanied by an artery or vein, which will supply the muscle's oxygen via circulation. Muscle attachment is the location of the bone where the muscle is attached. If bones are attached to bones via ligaments, we have mentioned that muscles attach to bones via the tendon or eponeurosis. In muscle attachment, there is what we call as origin and insertion. When the muscle contracts, one side moves and the other side remains stationary. Attachment can happen on both sides. It is the origin when the muscle is attached to the stationary end, usually the proximal end. And it is the insertion when the muscle is attached to the distal, movable end. You can also classify the attachment as either direct or indirect. Direct attachment is when the connective tissue appears to be too short, that the compartments or fascicles look like they are directly attached to the bones. Indirect attachment is when the connective tissues go beyond the muscles to attach to the perosteum of the bones. Since connective tissues here are longer and more encompassing, indirect attachments can withstand friction better than direct attachments. Microscopy of skeletal muscles. Earlier, we have tackled the three types of muscle tissues, and then we went over the foundations of the skeletal muscle structure. The basics now give you the ammunition to learn more about skeletal muscles at the microscopic level. Understanding the cellular level of the skeletal muscles means we have to talk about the muscle fibers. As discussed earlier, muscle fibers are actually cells. 
since they are cells, it follows they have the same structure as any autosomal cells have. We will only be a little bit more specific in naming them. For instance, muscle fibers have a plasma membrane, which we call a sarcolemma. This is the covering of the fiber itself and is different from the connective tissue endomyosome. Inside the muscle fiber is the cytoplasm, but we call it the sarcoplasm. In the sarcoplasm are the organelles like mitochondria and nucleus. It also contains glycogen and myoglobin, a pigment similar to hemoglobin, which supplies the muscle cells with oxygen. The most notable thing that can be found in the sarcoplasm is the myofibrils. These are cylindrical protein structures that run from one end of the fiber to the other. There could easily be hundreds to thousands of myofibrils in each cell, making them so packed inside that they squish the organelles and push the nucleus close to the sarcolemma so that it is more visible. This is why skeletal muscles appear to be multinucleated. The myofibrils, which occupy almost 80% of the muscle fiber, are contractile elements because they contain myofilaments. These myofilaments do not run from end to end of the fiber. Instead, they are enveloped in units called sarcomers. These sarcomers, on the other hand, are separated by a dense material called Z-lines. Myofilaments can be thick or thin. Thick myofilaments contain myosin, while the thin myofilaments contain the protein actin. These two proteins, myosin and actin, make the muscle contraction possible. While the myosin is rod-like and has two round heads, called the cross bridges, the actin is a double-stranded coil and contains tropomyosin and troponin, which are regulatory proteins. Another structure inside the muscle fiber that is closely related to the myofilaments is the sarcoplasmic reticulum, abbreviated often as SR. SR are membrane channels that form a network within the sarcoplasm. Its primary function is to transport calcium to the terminal cisterna sacs that handle calcium storage and are located in the SR itself. You can see calcium is very important when we talk about muscular contraction. Calcium ions will bind to the troponin so that the contractile proteins actin and myosin can be activated. This is why each skeletal muscle fiber has calcium-regulated molecular motors. When the muscles need to contract, gates will open to provide calcium to the myofilaments in the sarcoplasm. When the muscles are relaxed, the gates are closed and the calcium stays inside the SR. We might as well conclude this microscopic analysis of skeletal muscles with the T-tubules or the transverse tubules. T-tubules run from end to end of the sarcolemma. That is why the plasma membrane appears to have indentations or holes in it. The function of the T-tubule is not to bring anything into or out of the cell, hence it doesn't open in the interior of the fiber. Its job is to carry the nerve impulses from the extracellular space to the muscle fiber, particularly the terminal cisterna of the SR, so that calcium ions can be released. All right guys, I really hope you liked that video. If you did, please do me a favor, give the video a thumbs up, post a comment to let me know, and also make sure you subscribe to the channel. Also, if you are studying anatomy and physiology, make sure you become a member of my channel because I've uploaded my program, How to Study for Anatomy and Physiology, there. In that program, I give you specific tips on how to ace this class. I've taught thousands of other students how to ace it, and these are the tips that help me go from fail to acing anatomy. Also, make sure you stay tuned because in the next video we're going to go over the neuromuscular components which help with the muscle contraction. We're going to learn about the neurotransmitters ACH or acetylcholine. We're going to learn about depolarization, repolarization, and all of the different ions that assist with muscle contraction. So, can't wait to see you guys in the next video and I will see you then. Love you. Bye.